Good afternoon, and thank you for coming. Uh, we are Barco. So when we first set out to start this venture, we thought, you know, what can we examine? You know, we wanted to start with a fundamental force that drives human interaction. And so we looked at the way we socially interact with each other. You know, we wanted to make it more memorable, more delightful, and just genuinely more fun. So how could we do that? Well, we looked at something that has been prevalent in social interactions throughout pretty much all of history. The most famous social lubricant of them all, alcohol. So we set out and we developed a robotic bartender, a series of automated robotic bartenders that will mix perfect drinks consistently every time. So this is Sammy March, a good friend of mine. He is an electrical engineer, a senior in the engineering school here at GW. He has two patents to his name, both of which are for an ultrasound case for an iPhone that turns your iPhone into an ultrasound for inexpensive ultrasounds in low-income areas. This right here, my good friend, Elliot Liskin. He is our coding connoisseur. He spent this past summer doing an internship over at Apple. And actually, I don't know how many of you guys have Macs, but Elliot has some code in the most recent version of the operating system that is public. So uh, pretty impressive internship, if you ask me. So we wanted to figure out, what is it about the bar experience that we can make better, right? In terms of the business aspect, businesses want people in and out. They want a, they want a higher turnover rate, because higher turnover rate means more money for them, right? And me, as the customer, I want to get in. I want to have fun with my friends. I want to go out on the dance floor, dance a little bit. I want to get my drink and come back to my friends, right? The biggest factor in ruining this experience for everyone is just the amount of time that it takes to get your drink, right? So we came up with the best solution we could, and that is a robotic bartender, Carlos. And Carlos stands for Contained Alcohol Releasing Logic Operated System. So it's a bit of a forced acronym, but we'll take it, we'll take it. Um, so Carlos actually was a project of mine for a, a class that I built a couple years back. And since then, he's been used in the ABET accreditation of the engineering school here. And in case you guys don't know what that is, that is just the general accreditation of you know, engineering schools across the US. And basically, if you have an ABET accredited degree, it's considered a good engineering degree. Um, so this is the first iteration of Carlos. And it is one ugly looking machine. I mean, this is something that you put in your closet, right? You put it in the closet. You, serve, you, you make your drinks at the closet, and then you bring them out to your friends and say, hey, yeah, I made this in the back. Right? It is not very impressive. So we decided, what can we do? We can make Carlos better. So we went ahead, and we decided to improve upon him, and we made Carlos Dos. I don't know why this clicker is. There we go. So Carlos Dos is an improvement upon the first version. And Carlos Dos, uh, this is kind of a two and a half, and I'll get to that in a second, but he is much more entertaining to watch. He's kind of improved upon some of the difficulties that the first version had. Um, namely, we have this nice little carousel that, has, that houses all of the bottles with your mixers and alcohols up top. And all of them are poured from the bottle individually. And it spins around. And you get to watch the glistening of the light reflect off of it. And you know, it's, it's just more entertaining to watch. But that wasn't all we could do, right? Yeah. So when we looked at this, we said, what else could we do? And we came up with Carlos Trace. We imagine that Carlos Trace is going to be the final prototype of the Carlos series. Uh, we're just going to market it as Carlos. The numbers were sort of an internal numbering scheme that we had. Uh, but we said, you know, how can we improve on this design? Um, as you can see, it's made of wood. You know, we are working on a student budget. So you know, it is made of wood. So we said, you know, now that we're actually going into production, what can we do to make it better? We're going to laser cut it out of aluminum. Uh, so it's going to look really, really nice. It's going to be beautiful. But you know, what does that do for me as a consumer? You know, even if it looks the most, it's the most gorgeous thing on the bar top, you know, does it, you know, it, it's, it's awesome. But what does it do for me as the consumer? You still have to go up to the bar and wait 15 minutes to get a drink. So what we did is we went out and developed an app. And I have an app that I can show you right here. This is the Carlos app where you will be able to, you can play around with it. You'll be able to just select a drink and click the Order Now button. It'll then show you. It'll then say, you know, one minute and 53 seconds remaining, and you know that when you get to, um, you know, when that time is up, you can go up to the bar and your drink will be ready. Here's just some sample code of the app just to give you an idea. 
Um, right now it's on iOS, and you'll be able to use your iPad or your iPhone to order a drink. Um, so Carlos is one of a kind. We are creating a niche market, the, co the commercial uh, automated bartending market. We'll get to competition a little bit later, but there's nobody else in this market now. Um, we're creating a profitable field where we're going to establish ourselves as the premier, the forefront company in this field. So how are we going to do that? We're going to develop a brand. The most immediate thing and the most obvious thing to do is to use social media. You know, Twitter, Facebook, we can all do that. But from here is where it gets a little more interesting. We're going to use Kickstarter as a marketing tool. Now, Kickstarter, you know, everybody knows it as a, as a fundraising platform, and we're absolutely going to use it for that. But we're also going to use it for its underrated marketing value, where when you have a Kickstarter pitch, you know, it's, you get the word out there. People get invested in your project. They want you to succeed. We want them to succeed. And it's, it's, it's a mutually beneficial relationship between us and our backers. So that's going to focus on the consumer market. We're going to sell Carlos to the consumer market for $750. But if you back us on Kickstarter, you'll get discounted um, rates for Carlos. Uh, we're going to have a, a $50,000 cap on the Kickstarter. That is our goal. Uh, which is kind of low for a project like this, but as we said, you know, we want this more for the marketing value than for anything else. Um, from there, we're also going to be doing the old-fashioned door-to-door pitch. As I said, the Kickstarter is more for the consumer market, and the door-to-door -door pitch is going to be more for the commercial market. So we're going to be going around to bars, pubs, nightclubs, everything else, and just you know, talking with people. Because at Barco, we know that you know, we are embedded in these social interactions. This is what drives us forward. So, you know, the best way to convince somebody of something, to show something to somebody, is to say, you know, is to, is to go to them and talk to them and talk with them, see what they want, and to tell them what you have and what you can offer them. Carlos is kind of a win-win system. And what do I mean by that? We make money, the businesses make money, the bartenders make money, and in the end, everyone kind of ends up pretty happy. But how does that happen? We give away Carlos. The machine is free. Think of it kind of like one of those Coke machines, right, where you're paying for the Coke that goes in the Coke machine, but not the machine itself. Well, we went ahead, and we kind of looked into everything that goes, that goes into this. And we've decided that through the app, you know, every drink that you purchase through the app, there is an option to leave a tip for the bartender. Right? And what we've decided to go ahead and do is we are going to take a percentage of that tip as our revenue stream. So you know, the machine is free, but we get our money from the tips, same way a bartender does. Now, you might say, you know, who's going to tip a machine? But you know, in the end, what we, kind of, we kind of have a strategy for kind of, I don't know, socially forcing a hand. I don't know. It's, it, sounds a little, it sounds a little meaner than it is, but it's kind of a suggestion more than anything else. Anyway. So we make money when you make money because we make money off of your tips. The bars make money because they're getting a higher turnover rate. The bartenders are making money because now what's happening is they can focus on their drinks, making drinks, making money, making their tips. Carlos is right next to them, producing the same drinks equally as fast. And they're making 80% of the tips that come in through Carlos. So they're making extra passive income just by standing there behind the bar with the machine. And we're making our money off of that small percentage that comes from that. So you may be asking yourself, why do it through the tips rather than through the actual beverage itself? And that particular reason is because of regulations. So we've gotten in touch with ABRA, which is the Alcohol Beverage Regulation Administration. And we talked to one of their agents and kind of explained the whole idea. And he said, you know, this is what you can and can't do. It's going to be a huge legal nightmare if you want to go through and do, you know, through the alcohol revenues yourself. Um, so we decided to go through the tip system, and we talked to him about it, and he's like, yeah, that's fine as long as it's considered a, a service fee. So that's kind of where that comes from. So, you know, coming back to the competition now, there are two competitors in our field. Um, neither of them are in the commercial market. Both of them are in the consumer market. Uh, they are both two successfully backed Kickstarter projects. One's called Bartendro from Party Robotics, and the other one is Monsieur. Um, and let me, let me discuss their pros and cons with you now. So Bartendro starts at $2,500 and will run you all the way up to $4,000, depending upon the model you get. Some of the pros is that, you know, one of the, well, its biggest selling point is that it is open source and modular, 
which sounds awesome because it's easy to replace the alcohols. You can do whatever you want with it. And you know, if you know what you're doing, it's easy to manipulate. But the problem is that it comes as a kit. And unless you have you know, a, a working knowledge of electronics, you can't do anything with it. And if something breaks, you're on your own. You have to figure it out and you have to fix it on your own. Uh, another big problem with this design is that, as you can see, there's one funnel in the center. So all the alcohols come down through that funnel into your cup, which sounds like it's a simple design. But the problem is that remnants from previous drinks get caught up in your current drink. So what we did, we solved that problem. We had that problem with Carlos Uno. But we recognized that problem, and we solved it by having this multi-bottle approach where each bottle pours into your cup independently of any other bottle. So next up is Monsieur. I mean, you can see it's nice, compact, sleek. It's good looking. Uh, it's going to set you back $4,000. But you know, I guess if you're hosting a nice house party or something and you want to show off, be a nice option. The problem with Monsieur, uh, unlike our Carlos here and Bartendro, is it's extremely hard to replace the alcohol in it. Uh, and when I say that, I mean you have to unscrew a panel in the back to pull out the bottles and replace them. Not that bad if you're just doing a house party you know, once every now and then and you're not, you don't plan on replacing everything in it. But you know, if you're at a bar and you're going through four bottles of whiskey in a night, you, know, you don't want to have to unscrew the panel every single time. Right? So. so here are some of the financials. Um, these numbers we got from finding out how many bars are in the DC area. We're focusing on the DC area first. Uh, how many bars are in the DC area? How many people frequent those bars on a weekly basis on average? And then the average selling price of an alcoholic beverage. And from there, we, we, we constructed these graphs, um, you know, taking into account the difference that Carlos is only making you know, some of those drinks, whereas a bartender is making the rest, and we're only taking a portion of the drinks that, uh, the tips from the drinks that Carlos makes. Um, so as you can see, you know, we expect to see a nice amount of growth our first year because that's when we're having our you know, Kickstarter um, project and we're also going to be you know, using that door-to-door -door sales approach that we were talked about earlier. The second year is going to be just a little bit of growth because we expect to ride a little bit on the word of mouth. We're still going to be using that door-to-door -door sales approach, but we're not going to have that Kickstarter um, that, we, that we had our first year. But by the time the third year rolls around, we expect a significantly higher growth because by that time, we'll become a name, we'll become popular. People will expect to see at least one Carlos per bar, which means that we expect that more people will be, more bars will be interested in buying them, and more consumers will want one for their own personal use. And this other uh, graph, this pie chart, shows a, an approximate breakdown of, our, of where we expect our revenue to come from. We expect that mostly will be coming, it will be coming from the bar market, the, the commercial market, with about 20% coming from the uh, consumer market. So for our manufacturing uh, cycle, we want to be simple and direct. We uh, want to cut costs where we can and be, you know, no, no extraneous costs here. Uh, we're laser cutting the aluminum Carlos Trace out in China and then shipping it to the US for storage and uh, distribution. We're not selling abroad for the first couple of years, um, so we don't have to worry about storage or regulation there. Um, and then I'll pass it to Sammy to talk about refurbished models. Yeah, and so one of the questions that people have for us, at least you know, bars and owners that we've kind of just you know, gone and talked to about this is, what happens if it breaks on me? You know, we don't expect it to break. We, you know, we put a lot of time and effort into the engineering that went behind it. But what happens if it does? And we came up with a solution that, you know, at this point, the machine itself is not that expensive for us to build. So we will overnight you a new machine. And that old machine that is broken will take back make it into a refurbished model, we'll fix it up in-house, and that will become the new model that gets shipped out next time if there's an, you know, for anyone else who, who may have an issue. Marco, we make socializing more fun, more enjoyable, more memorable, and more delightful. We're doing that through Carlos, focusing on two markets, the commercial market and the consumer market. And our business model is such that everybody can win, everybody can benefit, and with that, We'd like to raise a toast to Carlos. Thank you. So now we'd like to take questions if there are some. Is this exactly what it would look like? No. So this, this is, is just a model. This is just a prototype. Yeah. This, as we said, this is kind of yeah. No. Yeah. We understand there are wires everywhere. It's very right. technical looking. We understand. As we said, this is kind of Carlos 2.5. Um, it's it's has the same design as Carlos Dos with some of the features of Carlos Trace. 
Um, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's in between. Uh, but uh, as we said, it's going to be significantly cleaner. Um, aesthetically looking. pleasing. Aesthetically pleasing, exactly. That's than, the goal. Than this. That's yes. the goal. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, can you just describe you know, what, what you envision it doing? I'm, I mean, clearly it's going to rotate in some fashion. And sure. So I'll just I'll give you a kind of brief breakdown. So say you order like a whiskey sour, right? Maybe one of these bottles has sweet and sour mix and the other one has whiskey in it. So what will happen is say this bottle back here has whiskey. This whole carousel rotates forward. The whiskey's front facing. And then that bottle twists upwards, raises, and pours your whiskey into your cup. And then what will happen is that will come back down. it will spin. The sweet and sour mix will come front and center. Tilt up, pour into your cup, come back down. And so, you know, some of the things that we're thinking about adding on to the third version, um, you know, the one that we're going to send out for production is adding kind of a queue system to the bottom. So if there are 10 or more people, you know, say at the bar and they're all trying to order drinks at the same time, you know, we don't want Carlos to all of a sudden just be pouring, you know, 10 different liquors into the same cup, right? So what we're going to do is we're, ha we're going to have a kind of a rotary base down at the bottom with 10 cup slots. So it'll fill up one cup, move the cup over, fill up another cup, move the cup over. And that way, in case someone isn't there right away, you know, we can still come back to them and, you know, they'll come up to the, they'll come up to the bar and, you know, on the phone, they'll say, I'm here, you know, tap a little button. They'll spin forward to, you know, their drink, they'll pick it up and they'll be on their merry way. Yeah. How does it measure accurately the ounces poured? Because so, that's a huge part of the profitability of Right. So one of the things that we wanted to make sure of was that there wasn't overspill. Uh, and that is exactly what you're saying. Right. You know, it's a huge issue for bars with, huge. you know, some guy lines up 10, 10 glasses and just pours down the line, and all of a sudden he lost 20% you know, of all the liquor that he had that night. Well, so what we've done with Carlos in this version is it's entirely timing based. In the next version, we've changed that to be using an IR sensor. So what it does is it points down and it measures the distance from the, you know, from the liquid up to where you are. And as that cup fills up, it'll say, oh, wait, here we go. This is the part where we, where we got to stop. Cuts out right there and it moves on to the next one. Well, I think there are also things that you can put in the end of the bottle that will me measure yeah. me, an accurate amount of, yeah. okay. But, but, I'm sorry, but do you have to, uh, you have to use your own bottles and? No, so that's, I mean, that's one of the, the fun features about this particular model is uh, it comes with these clamps, basically. And so these, you know, these bottles we just brought in because they're you know, some nice looking bottles for show. But basically, as long as the bottle you know, fits under this clearance, which will add a little bit more space in the next generation, any bottle's okay. So, you know, if you want to put a bottle of Jack Daniels in there versus a bottle of, you know, Maker's Mark, do whatever you want. Well, that, that's going to be, have to be behind glass. I mean, you don't want a so, drunk person yeah, so, standing in front of 10 bottles of no, 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 <laughs> liquor of that can... So, the, in the third generation, the one that has the, the, the rotary at the base, mm -hmm. there's a plexiglass shield in front, so that way, you know, if I come up to the bar and I see 10 glasses right there all filled up, I can't just reach in and grab all 10 and walk them over to my friends. Yeah. So when you come up to the bar, you press I'm here, the little plexiglass shield opens up, you reach in, you grab your drink, and you move on. Two, two questions. I mean, how do you get around the Alcohol and Beverage Commission of, of you basically serving yourself uh, with regards to underage drinking and things like that? So one of the things that we asked when we kind of looked into the whole idea was, whether we would be legally responsible for that. Um, and kind of what we heard from Abra was that because legally all the bars and any place that's selling alcohol is required to have a bartender behind the bar, that it, is st it still is part of the um, establishment's responsibilities to check for underage drinking because they have that bartender back there. So, you know, and one of the ways that we've kind of been trying to promote that idea is to have Carlos behind the bar, right. and the bartender has to hand the drink to the person rather than the person just reaching in and grabbing it themselves. Right. So, second question: I want to explore your, your kind of the decision on your revenue model with regards to percentage of the tips. Now, just doing some rough math. I mean, sure. if I assumed, and I know this is probably cheap, but at five dollars a drink, mm -hmm. that's exactly assuming a ten percent tip rate, mm -hmm. and you take twenty percent of that, that gives you about ten cents per mm -hmm. drink uh, for your revenue model. And at seven hundred and fifty dollars, that's seventy five hundred drinks that need to be dispensed in order for you to get to your retail or your price point. Yeah. As opposed to thinking about just selling the the unit for seven fifty sure. at an eighty percent estimated margin for the drink to the establishment, there was only like one hundred and seventy five drinks necessary. So you would think that the efficiency that it would get the bar 
So one of the things, that, to one of the things that we looked into them. was the idea that if you kind of take the average turnover rate, you know, the average you know amount of customers per establishment per you know large city, something like that, you get around seventy five consume you know seventy five people per you know turnover, um, and the idea being that even if they only buy one drink a person, you know seventy five drinks and say maybe half of them are bought through Carlos, that's still thirty five drinks in one turnover, I mean, you expect about two, three per night, you know, two, three full turnovers per night. You know, that still, that puts us at about, you know, what is it, maybe 100, 105 bucks a night on a busy night, per se. But then all it takes is seven weeks and I've recouped my cost of the machine. And then from then on out, I'm just making more money on, you know, my original investment of giving them the machine. So the idea was kind of have a revenue stream after the point of sale. Thank you very much. No. Thank you so much.